you can't have an everyday day dress made out of 14 yards of cotton. You just can't have that <laughs> in, without some connection to that slave, to that slave trade. Um, you know, before, you know, earlier on, you know, earlier eras before chattel slavery had really taken hold, it's sort of, you know, they're, they're interlinked issues, but cotton existed, but was extraordinarily, like no one had 14 yard cotton dresses. <laughs> so I think that's really important. And I, I wanted to uh, shout out also to the Welsh Viking. He has a really good YouTube channel. And he specifically has, um, to get way back, he specifically has a really great discussion about how kind of white supremacists have tried to take over or misuse a lot of Viking imagery and Viking materials as a way to say that there is just white pride or white, you know, or that it's their kind of place. And he has a really great video about how that's not appropriate and doesn't make sense. And, and that the actual Viking people who went to Viking, which of course is its own special thing, wouldn't, wouldn't have recognized an all white scenario as preferable to anything else. Um, so please go check him out. He's great. Uh, he also has a, just a very beautiful accent. So that's fun. Uh, <laughs> so I, I do just want to say some people who are experts in this field of, of what I'm calling English American dress have clear dog whistle, red flags, not all of them. We're probably when we're talking about resources, talk, going to say Victorian a lot. Technically, 1838 is right in the beginning of Queen Victoria's reign in England. Technically in America, that doesn't theoretically matter. A lot of people call it the Jacksonian era as a more specific appropriate description for people living in North America. Uh, Jacksonian is, uh, Jackson is a complicated figure yeah. to Cherokees. Um, Everyone will be happier if we keep that man's name out of our mouth. Maybe we should, I like to call it the Ross era because uh, Chief Ross was our <laughs> chief through this period and he was our chief for a very long time after. Um, so even though actually in retrospect, as I learned more about this exact decade, I feel oddly a little less and less secure in how perfect all of his choices were it that is still the appropriate leader that we had that was our um that was our principal chief was was ross so i usually call it ross era um sometimes i call it early romantic era um but we honestly we tend to default to call it victorian because honestly that's also feels like a less loaded term even though the victorian era actually covers a lot of very loaded decades. So, so then why did we decide to use English American dress for Polly, who was a Cherokee woman? Her peers included the Ross family and people like Minerva and George Mural. Um, while it appears, as Laura said, Polly didn't seem to have a large plantation with a formal home like the Murals. Um, the mill was an important piece of infrastructure that was almost certainly partially built uh, with slave labor. And the testimony captured in the WPA narrative suggests that Hildebrand's mill, which is how it became known, uh, and the farm around it was in fact a work camp and that there were enslaved individuals uh, being forced to work there throughout its life until um, abolition. And uh, portraits of Cherokee men from that era show them wearing what their American peers wore, fashionable English American dress, even our very famous image of Sequoia. Uh, when you first look at it out of context, he looks like he's in like his comfy little robe with his nice little turban and every piece of his clothing in that, in that image was deliberately him showing himself as a educated gentleman, uh, plus the turban, which has its own interesting uh, sidebar around Cherokee specific um, uh, history that actually relates back to our initial relationship with uh, the English and a visit to, uh, to London. Um, so I, I wanna say since I started this project, I started really looking for descriptions of Cherokee women, women participating in 19th century material culture, and I become more and more convinced that the women who had the means to do so dress exactly like Americans, like, uh, like their American counterparts. And again, I'm very being very distinct. In 1838, Cherokee women were not American citizens. 
Um, and there were even some specific ways that there was a, a threshold or a boundary uh, that even for white men who wanted to come live, live among Cherokees in whatever capacity, they kind of had to get permission from various levels of the United States government and, and their state governments to do so. And in fact, some of our direct ancestors who were white got various times were um, fined, imprisoned, or otherwise threatened by the government for remaining among the people that became their Cherokee relatives. So it, it wasn't this free, open, outlander <laughs> relationship. We, it was, there was a very clear boundary between Cherokee and American settlements. Um, and it's very important to acknowledge that. Um, that said, the boundary did not include lack of access to fashion. And it does appear from every piece of evidence that we have that if a woman could afford it, she dressed as nicely as she could and nicely for her being the same things that were being worn in Philadelphia, Boston, London, um, New York City. Uh, so I, I am gonna include links uh, to the description to these full uh, resources, but I, I wanna go from the skin out and just describe what I did and kind of where I made some missteps and what resources I used. Uh, because again, if you were interested in late uh, 1830s, I want you to be able to go right to it uh, because it is a lot, starting from the skin out, it's a lot of stuff. It ends up being, I think we calculated about 34 total yards of fabric. The resources I used, including the patterns and books that I used, uh, um, to actually make the gown itself ended up costing roughly five hundred dollars, and that and that's on top of that, there was a big list of purchased items which I will mention as I go through. Some of which you could purchase for less or make yourself, but just realistically, um, I'm doing some math in my head. The entire project for this to go from nothing to the uh, gown I was able to uh, do videos and photos of with Laura uh, that's let this spring, it was about $2,000. So that's the other piece is like, even my understanding is that it would have been a little bit less for most people to start, you know, you wouldn't usually start all the way over. Um, but I think it's important to acknowledge also that part of this fun little, like I wanna dress up and wear a giant dress and run around and do whatever hobby is also being realistic that it's an expensive hobby. Um, and that's leaving aside my literal years at this point of you know, training, practice, less classes and lessons I've taken in order to become you know, a competent enough seamstress to, to make these garments um, and to make them in a relatively historically informed way. I didn't make these all, this isn't all hand sewn. <laughs> The, the sewing machine technically existed by then. Um, and, and also a lot of garments could be mass produced. So a lot of the things that I'm having to start from fabric on would have at the time been possible to buy um, from a factory who had other, you know, impoverished and uh, exploited people making those things uh, in bulk, but it's still, it wouldn't necessarily have cost as much proportionally. Um, but so we start with the shift. Um, interestingly, I started with a shift pattern that was quote off the peg. Uh, I started with the black snail uh, pattern 321. Uh, it's a beautiful pattern. I love black snails work. Um, their stuff's always drafted really nicely. They have a lovely amount of information about the eras that they cover. Um, and I liked that shift, but the sleeves were the beautiful puffy sleeves were too bulky for the gown I ended up making. So I made that shift and kind of used it for a while while I was doing fittings and planning to get the gown. And when the, at the last minute, I realized it wasn't going to work. And I ended up cutting a gorge shift with short straight sleeves based on my 18th century uh, shifts but I added a uh, bust gores and a button on shoulder strap. The, the, the stays that I wear with this garment are so uh, very busty <laughs> and have this very, very wide, very straight backed 
um, shoulder strap that shifts kept kind of sh like shoving their way towards my neck and becoming visible when they're not supposed to be. And in the working woman, work woman's guide, which is an 1830s or early 1840s resource that was published in America at the time, um, she kind of mentions casually, you can cut a shift and have these best scores. And also you can have a shoulder strap where it buttons onto your stay straps so that everything stays tidy. And so I played with those proportions, I cut some muslins, and I ended up um, developing a shift of a style that I'm, I'm not sure anyone else is making or at least not publishing. So that was really exciting. I was very excited about it. And actually last week I published, I, I did a little um, Instagram reel just about the button on strap and it's one of my most popular reels ever. So I guess I'm, a lot of other people were excited about it too. Um, Second layer is a linen under petticoat. It is the most simple under petticoat you could have. Again, Laura and I do not like drawers. And while drawers were possible in this era, they weren't really required. Uh, and they weren't required for anything I was going to be doing. So I made a standard under petticoat. It's cut from one long panel, cut on the cross. It closes in the back. And I, get, I actually use the instructions from a dressmaker's guide, 1840 to 1865. Elizabeth Stewart Clark. Let me go back to my view so I can see, you can see this. So this book was ended up being very, very helpful to me as far as most of my construction details and even how to hand sew with buttonholes without going crazy. Um, I had tried many different methods and her description of how to do a buttonhole is so good that I have a bookmark in the book there. Um, so that was a really good resource for me. And then, a uh, corded petticoat uh, with a yoke and an attached comfort petticoat. So you had the corded petticoat, which is made from organdy. And inside of it, there's another very thin cotton petticoat just to essentially protect my body from the corded petticoat, which is scratchy. But instead of doing a straight uh, waistband, I used the yoke from the quilted petticoat in black snail pattern 321. Um, I'll include in the description the link to the book that I used to construct the body of the corded petticoat. It, it was a lot of straight stitching. I would not want to try to do it by hand, although you perfectly could. Um, on top of that goes a tucked petticoat with a nice deep lace flounce, flounce. Um, that has a straight waistband. On top of all of that goes the corded stays, which I commissioned from Red Threaded. Um, which is one of the kind of bigger, more expensive items on the whole ensemble, but honestly, they just make everything else work. Once you have the stays on and, you know, to pressure, as I call it, uh, you can't feel all the weight of all this fabric on you. It just, it just holds up everything and, and distributes pressure across your torso in a way that's really, um, honestly quite comfortable. Um, I've had a couple of abdominal surgeries and, I have some scar tissue in my abdomen, and uh, when I have these stays on, uh, the normal discomforts that I sometimes have, even just from a hard waistband, don't aren't there. It's just it's very comfortable. There's also a ruffled hip pad that I bought from Gibson Girl Dress. I cut off the ties and added buttonholes so I could button it straight to my stays, so I didn't have to have yet another thing wrapping around my lower torso and causing potential bulk where I didn't want it. Um, and that's all the stuff that you can't even see when the dress is on. And I think we talked about this last time that when you look at these gowns or dresses from the outside, there's a point where when you learn enough, you can see that they, that even though you can't see all of this stuff, that it has to be there or the dress wouldn't have fit like that. You humans, you know, fat, skinny, tall, short humans have a general shape that they're gonna have. And when you see a gown fitting over a person in a certain way and the skirt falls in a certain way, it's, it's not likely that they don't have all this other stuff under it if they've got a certain shape. And so yeah, basically- A modern analogy might be once you start really looking at men's sport coats or jackets, like yeah. when you're watching the news, for example, um, challenge yourself. Like they, they are all wearing shoulder pads. And if, if a man's jacket or sports suit 
or sports suit, my goodness, or <laughs> the sport coat, the sport coat fits them well. You don't necessarily notice that the padding. Yeah. Is if it's done right, you won't see it, but it's in but, there. Yeah. It, but it's got to be there because nobody looks like that. No one has that shape. Yeah. Well, <laughs> and, and even the very lightest, most, you know, soft tailored Italian jacket, you know, a summer jacket made out of like the lightest tropical wool you can see as he's moving that there's something usually in the shoulder, there's something covering this whole section here, like pretty much the whole front has something in it because people aren't shaped like that. And they, <laughs> a coat won't sit like that. You think about picture a man in it. Okay, here's a good one. Picture like Mr. Rogers in a cardigan. Oh, hey, Countess. Versus if he has on, if he's the, when he was testifying in front of Congress and he had a suit coat on, because that was appropriate, very different looking shoulder line on that man. Same man. <laughs> and, but he, you have to have all that stuff inside or it doesn't sit like that. And so if you have a dress that's fitting somebody where it's got this beautiful line and then it poofs out like this, they kind of have to have all the other stuff under there in some form to get this silhouette and I'm actually showing this is the pattern I used that informed me a lot about the actual dress that we ended up making and I will get to the stuff that you can see and then we can um, uh, go into some more details so the things you can see when the dress is on at the neckline you can see the shimmy set I bought that from Madame B Antique um, and I believe she's in Italy um, I bought some silk stockings, which you can kind of see a little bit uh, uh, as I'm wearing the gown. I have uh, American Duchess booties. Uh, they're little wool-lined, flat, uh, lace-up booties. I also wear with this garment a early Victorian cap, also from Madame B Antiques. I ended up drafting a cap from the... Um, work women's guide and I muslined it and then I bought the stuff to make it and it is that stuff is I know where it is <laughs> but I uh I'm a big fan of Madame B's 18th century work and I was browsing her Etsy store one day and saw there was a beautiful cap almost just like the one I had designed for myself and I could click a button and have it delivered to my home so that's what I did uh, but the cap is there mainly to protect my hair from the bonnet um, and to protect the bonnet from my hair, which usually has at least some pomade in it. And uh, the custom bonnet was from Shocking Bad Hats. I wrote her and asked about this area and we walked through some options. I sent her some swatches of my fabric and she just made this beautiful bonnet to go with my dresses.